So today we are uh, going to have some brief review of uh, dynamics, not all of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Uh, it will be impossible to have it in one hour, but uh, for uh, the main things or the main concepts that we need in, in vibration. Uh, so, uh, what you are going to, to, to learn uh, in this lecture, uh, what will be the outcome of this lecture is first, uh, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to uh, remember how to calculate a mass moment of inertia uh, specifically for some typical uh, bodies. Uh, so uh, this is the mass moment of inertia is important uh, when writing uh, the moment equation of the second Newton's law or when calculating the kinetic energy. Now, after that, we, we are going to remember, and you will be able at the end of this lecture to remember what is the second Newton's law and how to write it and how to apply it uh, in the case of some problems of vibration. Uh, also, you will be able to remember uh, how to calculate the kinetic energy and potential energy also all recalls here are, are uh, directed or uh, presented in a way to be uh, linked to the problems that we will have in, in vibration. You will be also uh, able to remember uh, uh, how to calculate the work of a force or a couple moment. Uh, this one, it's also able, uh, this is interesting when we are, uh, where we, if we are going, uh, going to apply the principle of work and energy, and of course, uh, you will remember by the end of this lecture what is the principle of work and energy, and also uh, what is the conservation of energy. So this is our targets uh, today, is to, to remember all uh, these concepts uh, from dynamics. So, uh, first, okay, I, I'm going to follow the, the learning outcomes more or less. So first, I, I'm going to introduce or to, to recall more precisely the mass moment of inertia, uh, then the second Newton's law, uh, then uh, what is the kinetic energy, uh, the work, uh, what is the work and what is the potential energy, uh, and at the end, I will, I'm going to recall uh, what is the principle of work and energy. And uh, let's start together with the mass moment of inertia. Okay. So, what's the mass moment of inertia? It is a moment. What means a moment? A moment when you take any, any, uh, any any variable uh, and you multiply it by the perpendicular distance. Now, like the moment of a force, when you multiply the force by the perpendicular distance, uh, we have the moment of the force. Now, the moment of inertia here, the inertia is in, in linear or translation motion is the mass. So, the uh, mass moment of inertia is here is the second moment of a mass. It is the second moment of the mass. It means here, if I, it is the second moment, it is I'm, apply, I'm multiplying by the distance square. So the first moment when we multiply by the distance. The second moment when we multiply by the distance square. So if I, I, I consider I have a whole body, and I focus on a small uh, elementary mass, a mass here, for example, dm. To calculate, calculate the mass moment of inertia of dm, I will multiply dm by the perpendicular distance. Now, the mass moment of inertia and all moments actually will be calculated with respect of an axis. Now, here, in, in, we are interested in play, 
planar motion, in two-dimensional motion. So here, the rotation is always about the axis Z. So we are calculating, and uh, we are going to calculate the mass moment of inertia about the axis Z. Now, the, the, if I look in, in plane, in two-dimensional problems, now I, I can assimilate the axis Z to the point P. So sometimes uh, you will see that I, I'm using the axis Z, so I will say that the mass moment of inertia with respect to the axis Z, uh, this is uh, the definition, and sometimes shortly uh, I will say it is IP, which is the mass moment of inertia with respect to the point. And this point P is where the axis Z crosses the plane. Now, this is R, it is the perpendicular distance. And the elementary mass moment of inertia, di, okay, of course, z, it is R squared dm. Now, this is for a small uh, mass or elementary mass or an element of mass. Now, if I want to do it or to calculate it for the whole body, I need to add all of this together. And to add all of this together, to sum all of uh, of these all dIz, so I will calculate the dIz one by one, and I need to sum all of them, and to sum this elementary mass moment of inertia, it is simply the integral. So we need to integrate all r square dm for the whole body. Now if I have the density, the small dm, it is simply the density times the small dv. So I can integrate on the mass or on the volume. And this is mainly and mostly what we, we do. It is to integrate uh, on the uh, volume. Now, as I have said, we are in, in planar motion, so we can confuse writing iz or ip. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Why? Because we don't, we have only one one axis that we are interested in, which is the out-of-plane axis, the, the z axis, and the point P E is the point where the axis z is crossing. Now this is the definition, and it's not uh, useful. Uh, this definition is used to calculate the mass moment of inertia only for uh, complex geometries. Now for uh, we have some simpler equations uh, to, to, to calculate the mass moment of inertia. But before that, what is the mass, uh, mass moment of inertia? The mass moment of inertia, it, it's a kind of resistance to angular acceleration or deceleration. Now, uh, the resistance, the body resists uh, and shows his resistance to acceleration or deceleration by the mass moment of inertia. What does that mean? It means if uh, the body has a high or a large mass moment of inertia, it is difficult to accelerate or decelerate that body, especially in rotation here for the mass moment of inertia. This is true for the mass for the translation. If a, if a body has a large mass, it is difficult to accelerate it or decelerate it in a translation motion. Now, for the mass moment of inertia, if it has a large mass moment of inertia, it is difficult to accelerate the body or decelerate it. And of course, if it is uh, difficult to decelerate it, it is uh, difficult to stop. So the higher mass of the, the higher mass moment of inertia, the more difficult we need more uh, f higher forces to stop. Uh, higher here, okay, it's a rotation. So so higher uh, moments to stop the rotation motion of the body. So the mass moment of inertia. It is a resistance to the angular acceleration or deceleration of the body. Now, also, 
uh, we will see. And this is, uh, if you remember, in machine dynamics, we use the mass moment of inertia to calculate, the, especially for flywheels, to calculate uh, uh, the kinetic energy to be stored. Now, the mass moment of inertia is also, it's a kind of uh, the container or the reservoir of the angular kinetic energy. So this is uh, for the body that has large mass moment of inertia, we can store more kinetic energy. If, of course, the body, the opposite, if the mass moment of inertia is, uh, is low, we uh, cannot store more energy. So uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, a large reservoir, a large container and, and a small reservoir. So if the mass moment of inertia is large, it means that the body has a large reservoir, large possibilities and uh, uh, to, to store a kinetic energy. And this is, for example, if you remember from machine dynamics, uh, most flywheels have large mass moment of inertia to be able to store more kinetic energy. Now, we have some, some useful equation. Uh, it's not easy to, to deal always with the integrals, especially when integrating on, on, on uh, volume uh, or on an area in 2D. So uh, there is some useful uh, equation uh, that are more suitable for us and uh, this is mainly what we will use to determine the mass moment of inertia for the bodies that we will deal with because uh, we will uh, deal with bodies that, has a sim that have simpler uh, geometry. So the first one when we have to deal with uh, two or more bodies actually, okay? So if you have one uh, large body that is built by, uh, by parts, that has, uh, for example, here, just to be simple, two parts, uh, a body B1 and the body B2, and they are tightly assembled together. This is, they should, okay, together make uh, a new uh, rigid body. Together, they have to make a new rigid body uh, to consider them uh, as a new rigid body. What, what does that mean? A rigid body is when you have no relative motion. It means that B1 and B2, there is no relative motion. No change of distance and no change of angle. There is no translation of B2 relatively to B1 and no rotation of B2 relatively to B1. So the two together, they make one whole body, but okay, B1 and B2, each one has a simple geometry that I can, uh, for, for it, calculate the mass moment of inertia. So assume that I can calculate the mass moment of inertia of B1, and I have the mass moment of inertia of B2. So I how I can determine the mass moment of inertia of the new body, it is simply by adding them together. Okay. So I have the two bodies, B1 and B2, and I know the mass moment of inertia of each one. And it's quite simple to, to, to calculate uh, the mass moment of inertia of the new body, the assemblage of the two new, new body. It is simply by adding the mass moment of inertia of each one. Now, here, uh, let me insist a little bit that here I'm using the same P. They should be all calculated with respect to the same axis and to the same point P, okay? So here, for example, I should also calculate the mass moment of inertia of B2 with respect to the axis Z crossing P. And then in a second step, I can add. If the mass moment of inertia are not calculated in the same point, in that case, Okay, I cannot add them together. The one condition and the, uh, the, the only one condition here to add uh, the two together, it is that the two should be calculated with respect to the same axis, with respect to the same point. Now, this is a very useful 
uh, rule. Uh, why? Because, okay, sometimes we have bodies that are, okay, at the first sight, they have a complex shape, but I can cut it in, in multiple pieces, not only two. I can cut it in, in different pieces, and uh, each piece has a simpler geometry and for which I can calculate the mass moment of inertia. Now, the parallel axis theorem, and this is also a very useful equation. Uh, mostly, we have the mass moment of inertia available in the center of mass. It, it's available for, for, very, for a wide range of geometries. We have it. Now, uh, how to deal if I want to calculate uh, the mass moment of inertia uh, in another point? Uh, okay, it's always here in a planar motion. With, it will be uh, with respect to the axis Z. But there is the axis Z that crosses the center of mass G, but another axis Z which crosses uh, another point P. There, these two axes are parallel. Now, in this case, it's also quite simple. If I know the mass moment of inertia here, IG, with respect to the center of mass, and I would like to have it in another point. It's simply I need to add m times gp, the distance between the two axes, the perpendicular distance between the two axes, square. m gp square. gp is the distance between the two points into d, or the, the perpendicular distance between the two axes. Now, uh, uh, let me insist here that it should be G. I cannot, if I have, for example, uh, the mass moment of inertia in P, and I would like to do it in another point Q, it's impossible to use the equation here. I, knew, I need to go through always the center of mass. So this is only valid if I start from the center of mass. IP, in any point, I can use it for any point, it's equal to the mass moment of inertia in, in G, the center of mass, plus M, the distance square. So these are the two useful rules, uh, uh, highly useful for calculating the mass moment of inertia. Now, later on, we need uh, uh, some uh, the mass moment of inertia of some typical uh, bodies, some typical geometries. Here, mostly, I, I will recall only two. Uh, the two that I am, uh, that we will mostly use it. So, the first one is uh, for a disk. Uh, this is, uh, in this case, it is uh, just the mass of the disk times the radius squared divided by two. This is also I'm insisting here, this is what is given in, in the center of mass, I, G, with respect to the center of mass. If I would like to calculate it in a different point, in that case, I will use the parallel axis theorem, okay? Also here, I can use, uh, or uh, I will give the mass moment of inertia of a bar or a rod. Uh, if it is about the center of mass, it is the mass times the, the length of the bar, L here is the length of the bar square, divided by 12. Okay, so uh, the mass moment of inertia with respect, of, with respect of the center of mass, it is ML square over 12. Here, uh, sometimes for bars, we need it uh, at the extremity or at the end of the bar in the point E. Now, in that case, okay, we can use, and this is how to establish the equation that I'm going to give, it is, uh, we use it, the parallel axis theorem, and if I will use the parallel axis theorem, I will find it is ML square over three. So be careful for bars where uh, to use it. I'm, going, uh, uh, I'm giving here the two, because uh, it, it is common to, to, to calculate the one of the bar at one end. 
So, uh, so it's it's common to use it. So I'm giving it. If you forget about it, the second relation, you can use the one uh, here, the one of the center of mass, and uh, using the parallel axis theorem, you can get back IE. Actually, in IE or any different uh, or any different point. Okay. So these are the main relations that we are going to use for the mass moment of inertia. Okay, let's uh, go uh, to the second part and recall uh, the main things, uh, the main concepts regarding the second Newton's law. Now, I'm going to start with the linear equation, with the translation equation, okay? So for this, uh, as all you know, uh, to write the second Newton's law, I need to first to draw the free body diagram. The free body diagram is, uh, is a representation or a schematic of the body with all the, the external forces applied on it and the couple moments, the moments that, are, that result from uh, two forces th that are uh, cancel each other, but they give a non-zero moment. So in the free body diagram, I need to give all or to draw all the forces or the external forces. I insist for the second Newton's law that we are only interested and we are only dealing, dealing with the external forces and the external moments. So we need first the free body diagram to know what are the external forces and we need uh, the kinetic diagram. Sometimes we, we, we ignore the kinetic diagram because it is uh, quite uh, obvious, but sometimes it's important to, to draw it if, if the, the acceleration of the center of mass, it's not, it's not uh, common. So we need to draw uh, the two together. Why? Because the second Newton's law gives a, a relation between the forces and the acceleration and between the moments of forces and the angular acceleration. So it, it, the linear equation, you all know it. I'm just going to recall it. It is, I need to write sum of forces. All the forces, all the external forces equal M times AG. And let me insist here it is AG. You cannot. Here it is, okay, for a particle there is one point. Okay, or all the mass is assumed to be in one point. So it doesn't matter, it, it's one point, so you know the acceleration, it's completely definite. Now, if you have a rigid body, the acceleration from one point to another, it is, it's different. It's not the same acceleration. So in that case, which one we need to take? Here in the equation, I insist it should be the one of the center of mass. You cannot take any any point for the equation on the Newton's equation. So sum of forces equal m and times the acceleration of a uh, center of mass. Now here, this is why I have said that the mass is a kind of resistance to acceleration and deceleration because with the same force, if you have a high mass, the acceleration will be low. So the mass is a resistance to acceleration. It's hard to accelerate or decelerate the opposite, a, a, a body having a large mass. Now, this equation is, is a vector equation and we are in, a, in planar motion. So I can uh, have from this equation two, two scalar equation, one along X and one along Y. Now later, uh, we will have also the moment equation or the angular equation which links the moments, all the moments with the angular acceleration. So I will have sum of moments about G uh, equal IG, the mass moment of inertia times alpha. Here, why a mass moment of inertia is important, and also for the same consideration, uh, the IG is a resistance to acceleration, because for 
if ig is large and if uh, for the same moments I will have uh, lower acceleration okay now the mass the, the moment equation we can write actually we can write it with respect to, to any point but we need to be very careful to write it like this one it's only possible to write it for the center of mass so that's why I highlighted here G to say that this is true for the center of mass so I will recommend you to use it with the center of mass or if you have a fixed point you can write it with respect to the fixed point also you can write it with respect to the fixed point now if you want to choose it and to write it in a different point P you need to consider the moments of the inertia forces and that's why I recommend now at least for for our case I recommend against don't use it uh, in different points please use it specially and mainly with respect to the center of mass this is always true or with respect of a fixed point of the body now let's go to uh, recall uh, what are the kinetic energy work and potential energy now the kinetic energy the kinetic energy is the energy that, that has a body because uh, because it's moving now if a body is moving so it has a certain velocity or it can be a, a translation motion or a rotation motion it can be a linear velocity or angular velocity as soon as a body is moving it has kinetic energy so the kinetic energy is related or tightly related to its motion and of course if the body stops if the body is a static the kinetic energy is zero so if the body moves it has a kinetic energy if it stops there is no kinetic energy now so the kinetic energy is tightly related to the motion and it will increase if I increase velocity if I will increase speed or I will increase the angular velocity so if the speed or angular velocity any one of them increases of course the kinetic energy will increase so this is for example what we use it in in flywheels to store more kinetic energy in flywheels we increase the speed we increase the angular velocity actually okay so the kinetic energy is tightly related to the motion of the body and of course if I want to store more energy uh, I need large masses or large mass moment of energy that's why I have said in the beginning that the mass moment of inertia is a kind of reservoir or something to contain kinetic energy to be able to store more energy I need either for translation motion a large mass or for a rotation motion I need a large mass moment of inertia now uh, how to calculate the kinetic energy it will it will differ uh, from uh, uh, depending on the type of motion if I am in translation if I am in rotation motion or uh, fixed axis rotation actually or it is the general motion now if the body or the particle is translating only has only a translation motion the kinetic energy and this is what you have learned from the beginning and this is what is also true for particles the kinetic energy is one half m vg square one half the mass times the speed square the velocity the linear velocity of the center of mass square now here if the body is translating all points are moving in the same way so okay I'm 
telling it is VG, but it can be for any point of the body as soon as it is translating because any body translating, all points of that body has have the same velocity. This is for translation. For fixed axis rotation, the rotation is not necessarily about the center of mass. So if here, for example, the body is rotating about a point O, the axis of rotation O here is fixed, it's not moving, and the body is rotating about O. Now in this case, the kinetic energy is half the mass moment of inertia I times omega square. Okay, so here it is a kind of analogy between translation and, and rotation. The I, the mass moment of inertia is, is have the same role uh, as the mass and the angular velocity has the same role as the speed. So for translation, K is half mvg square and for the fixed axis rotation, K, the kinetic energy is half I omega square. But I here, it's not choice, should be about the axis of rotation. I, O, O is the axis of rotation. It's not here I, G, I cannot choose it. It's not choice here. We need to calculate the mass moment of inertia about the axis of rotation O. Here, uh, let me also uh, uh, highlight something that, okay, here I use it K for kinetic energy. Sometimes in some references, they use T for kinetic energy, okay? But you can deal. It's, it's, solely, uh, it's, it's only a matter of, of notation. Now, uh, in the case of general motion, I, I need to combine all of them, but I will combine the, all of them with the center of mass. So the general one, the general uh, equation is that K, the kinetic energy, will be half the mass Vg square plus half Ig omega square. Now again here, again here, it is the center of mass. And also I don't have to choose it. I need to calculate the, the speed in the, of the center of mass and I need to calculate the mass moment of inertia with respect of the center of mass. Okay, this is for a general motion for a, a body that have both translation and rotation motion combine it. Okay, this is kinetic energy. Now I need also to recall a force. So this is what you have learned also, it's simple. Uh, a review, simply a review. Now, the, 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 the work is the force times the distance. Now, uh, if the, the force is constant, we simply just multiply the force by, by the whole distance made by the body. Now, if the force is variable, I need to do it by elements, uh, uh, by tiny uh, movements. So the R is a tiny movement, an elementary, uh, uh, an elementary uh, motion of the body. So if the body will move by simply a dr, a tiny uh, distance, now the elementary work du will be f scalar product dr. Now, if uh, they are in the same direction, I can multiply the two amplitudes. Now, if not, I need to do the scalar product. Now, if I want uh, to calculate the whole work from a position one to a position two, I need to, uh, to integrate. To integration is summing all the effects. It's kind of, I have a path and I will cut the path in, in tiny elements and I will calculate the work for each tiny element and then I need to add all of them together. And when I will add all of, uh, and I, 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 I add all elementary elements, okay, in this case I'm doing integration. Now for a moment I can do the same, it's quite similar. Uh, I will have uh, four 
uh, to if the moment is constant I will simply multiply the moment by the angle by the rotational angle now if the moment is variable it depends on the angle theta I need to cut all the rotation in small pieces and do it piece by piece and then to, inter uh, to add them together and adding together all of these is simply integrating okay now potential energy is uh, potential energy is the energy that have that has a body due to conservative forces due to the work of conservative forces because there is some work that con that uh, the, that forces that are conservative it means that their energy their work is reversible is not completely dissipated that the body can take energy from that force but it can restitute it to it so there is an exchange so in this case the body we can say has a potential energy the potential energy are due to conservative forces mainly here we will focus only on, on two kinds in, in mechanics in mechanics we have two types of potential energies uh, the gravitational potential energy to, due to the weight okay the gravitational potential energy is the energy that has a body because of the presence of weight because of the force of weight now the potential energy of the gravitational potential energy of the body it depends on the height which is here yg of the center of mass it depends only on this so the potential energy the gravitational potential energy p g p for potential energy and g for our gravity the po gravitational potential energy is simply the mass of the body times the height here yg of the center of mass also here let me insist that in some references the potential energy is is denoted as v now also uh, the second type of potential energy is the elastic potential energy so i will call it here pe p for potential energy and e for elastic and uh, it is due to uh, the force of a spring now here it is equal to one half k k is the stiffness of the spring and x x is not be careful here it's not the, the the displacement of the body it is x here is how much the spring is stretched x here refers to the stretching of the spring so our reference here this point the zero where x x is zero it is when the spring is unstretched so this point when the spring is unstretched and this is our reference x gives the stretching of the spring so if for example originally if the spring uh, and stretch the spring is L0 now in this case the total length of the spring now is L0 plus X so X is how much the spring is stretched so uh, both of these are highly useful and especially the elastic potential energy it is highly useful in in vibration in establishing the equation in in modeling vibrational problems now the last point uh, just I'm going to recall the principle of work and energy uh, all of these concepts you have already seen them in 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 uh, dynamics now uh, what is the principle of work and energy so I have a body which is uh, going through a certain path if I focus only on what happens between a position R1 and a position R2 uh, 
what tells the principle of work and energy that the kinetic energy here in the second position, K2, it is equal to the kinetic energy uh, in the beginning, in the first position, K. So any change of the kinetic energy, it is due to, to the work delivered to the body. If there is no work, so the work is zero, the kinetic energy will be the same. The kinetic energy will not change. So this is the principle of work and energy. And sometimes to establish the equation of motion, we can use either the, the second Newton's law or the principle of work and energy. Now, in, in some cases, in some cases, uh, there is no, uh, no dissipating forces. There is no forces applied on the system uh, that dissipate energy. All the forces are conservative. So in this case, if all the forces are conservative, we have conservation of energy. The total energy of the system is conserved. It's not changing. It's constant. So in this case, I can use that, okay, in this position, I can calculate uh, kinetic energy and potential energy and add them together. This should be equal to the kinetic energy plus potential energy in the first position. So in any position, actually, if I will add the kinetic energy and potential energy, they should be the same as the original position. There is no change of the total energy. This is the, the, the energy that uh, it is conserved, it's not changing, that is, it's not dissipated, okay? So also here, now mostly, if there is no damping in, in vibration, I, I, I talked uh, Tuesday about damping, we are going, going to do, um, to study damped and undamped vibration. If there is no damping, okay, I have conservation of energy and I can apply this equation to, to, to establish equation of motion.